Good morning. I'm Anand Mitchell, director of RMIT's Micro Nano Research Facility. Before I get started, um, just so we're all on the same page about what micro and nano actually mean, um, I'd like to illustrate a few length scales. So this is about a meter. A millimeter is a thousand times smaller than that, as we all know. Um, this is about the, the size of a printed full stop on a page. Now, I'm finding that that's about as small as I can see these days with, without glasses. Now, a micrometer is a thousand times smaller than that. That's about the size of the smallest cells that make up our body. And it's about the limit of what you can actually see with an optical microscope. A nanometer is a thousand times smaller than that again. This is about the size of a single molecule of glucose. And with the world's most powerful electron microscopes, you can just about see at that scale. Now, just a little smaller than that, at a tenth of a nanometer, you're at the atomic scale, and these are the basic building blocks of matter. So, as director of the Micro Nano Research Facility, people sometimes ask me, why micro and nano? Surely nanotechnology is the, is the logical successor to microtechnology, and therefore, at this stage, we should just have the nano research facility. Hopefully, by the end of this talk, you'll understand that microtechnology and nanotechnology are actually different, and you'll share my enthusiasm about the opportunities that combining these two technologies can bring. So, first, to understand microtechnology, I'd like to take you back 500 years to the invention of the printing press. So, the Gutenberg printing press consisted of uh, standard pieces of metal type that could be arbitrarily reconfigured on a plate, coated with ink, and pressed into a paper page. Suddenly, it was possible to create arbitrary pages of text in large volumes, even entire books, um, and make these at a cost that was accessible to most people. Now, printing technology has advanced rapidly. Until about 250 years ago, it was possible to write, print, and distribute an entire newspaper in a single day. In fact, in, 19, in 1760, the United Kingdom printed over 10 million newspapers in a single year. About 100 years ago, photography emerged, and that further advanced printing technology until newspaper manufacture reached its peak about 60 or 70 years ago when the United Kingdom was printing 15 million newspapers every day and selling these at a price that everyone could afford on a daily basis. This was the first mass manufacture industry. And learning how to print text at these sorts of scales rapidly and cheaply has changed the way we communicate and revolutionized society. Now, about the same time that newspaper manufacture reached its peak about 60 or 70 years ago, people discovered how you could print functional electronic circuitry. Now, these these microchips, these microelectronic circuits, um, had components and wires that were about 100 microns wide. That's about the width of a human hair. Now, this, um, first, um, this was the first microtechnology. And in that sense, microtechnology means the capability to print functional electronic circuitry at microscopic dimensions but do so in a way that scales to mass manufacture. Now, um, this technology has advanced rapidly over, over, over the years, and um, so now it's possible to fit um, over a billion components on a chip the size of my thumbnail and have each of those components um, operate on a billion instructions every second. The net result of this is that um, we each have a computer in our pockets that's vastly more powerful than the supercomputers that guided the moon landing and have cameras on them vastly more powerful than those on the Hubble Space Telescope. Now, even though the components on a modern computer are significantly smaller than a micron, these, we still call this technology microtechnology. And that's the significance of micro in the micro nano research facility. It's the ability to create functional um, systems at microscopic dimensions, but particularly in a way that scales to mass manufacture. So what comes next? 
Um, the um, te technology, the component technology has been scaling exponentially, getting smaller and smaller and faster and faster for decades. But it can't keep doing this indefinitely. In fact, modern computers, the components are only 10 nanometers wide. That's about 20 atoms. If we get much smaller than this, the structuring at the nanoscale will actually change the fundamental nature of the materials that the structures are made out of. So what happens is that materials that we're familiar with at the macro scale start to exhibit new and unexpected behaviors, new electronic properties, new optical properties, new mechanical properties, and even new chemical properties. This is a whole new realm. This is nanotechnology. Now, the ability for nanostructuring to change materials in new and unexpected ways has a lot of traditional electronics manufacturers quite concerned because it means that they can't rely on the continued exponential scaling of their technologies. But the potential for nanostructuring materials to create new material functionalities creates some really exciting opportunities. Imagine if it was possible to create microchips that not only controlled electronic information, but also controlled light, controlled movement, could control fluids and sound. Imagine being able to cre create new chemical functionality simply by controlling the structure of things at, at, at the nanoscale, and to be able to do this on chips that could be mass manufactured in their millions and sold for only a few dollars each. That's exactly what we're do interested in at the Micro Nano Research Facility. So to give you some idea of what's possible, I'd like to give you a few examples. Our researchers are currently exploring how nanotechnology can be used to create sensors for an array of gases that have unprecedented sensitivity, but using microtechnology to integrate these sensors with electronics and antennas in a format so small that it can be encapsulated in a pill that you can swallow. Now, this pill senses the gas, gases in your gut and reports in real time to a mobile phone, revolutionizing how we understand our uh, metabolisms. Our researchers are also looking at how nanomaterials can sense small vibrations and, and minute movements, and are using microtechnologies to encapsulate these in hermetic packages so that they can be embedded in the, implanted in the body and survive indefinitely. Now, we're looking at how to embed these, um, encap uh, these encapsulated sensors in 3D printed titanium bone implants, and then use this so that we can interrogate them once implanted to see how the bones are healing around the implants and also to guide rehabilitation. You'll also hear from my colleagues about how nanoscale vibrations can be used to develop and deliver new medicines and also how the marriage between microtechnology and nanotechnology can result in very low-cost transparent sensors that you can wear on your skin. Now, my own research is in um, photonic chips, which are traditionally used for um, high-speed communications such as in, in the internet, but also with microfluidic chips that control biological fluids such as blood. By bringing these two technologies together, we can create extremely selective and sensitive, sensitive sensors. So these sensors can detect biomarkers, very, very specific biomarkers, and detect them at sensitivities where we can detect even a single molecule. Now, the applications of this technology are, are quite diverse. For example, we've been working with a European partner to create a sensor system that floats on a buoy in the Mediterranean Sea off the coast of Barcelona. And this sensor system takes a sample of seawater each day and, and monitors it for traces of antibiotics that may have resulted from um, agricultural farming inland and, and run off through, through the rivers. Um, we're currently talking to Melbourne Water about how we can use this technology to monitor contaminants in our own water supply. We're also working with a Victorian company to create a sensor platform that can fit in the back of, the amb back of an ambulance and be operated by paramedics and allow them to conclusively diagnose whether a patient is having a heart attack. Now, this has the potential to allow life and death decisions to be made about how that patient is treated as the patient is being transported to the hospital. And this has the, the potential to save many lives. 
It also represents a, a, a massive glo uh, global business opportunity for our Victorian industry partner. So you might think that these micro and nanotechnologies sound like science fiction, that it would be hard for a small business to engage um, with this sort of technology. But at the Micro Nano Research Facility, we're committed to making this technology accessible. Particularly, we understand that in order to engage, we need to be able to respond quickly. And so those two sensor examples, um, I'd, I'd like to let you know that we actually made prototypes of those within about six months. We've also been investing to in personnel and infrastructure to try and make this, this time to produce a prototype that can be tested in, in, in your environment even faster. Um, as an example, we've invested recently in a 3D printer that can actually print at the 100 nanometer scale. That's smaller than you can see with a microscope. And we're using this 3D printer with a Victorian company to create injection molding dyes um, that will be used in a, in a few months to create pla disposable plastic diagnostic tools that will be manufactured in Victoria and exported to the whole world. So these are just a few examples of how Victorian industries are engaging with the Micro Nano Research Facility. Um, please talk to us about, uh, and we can t discover together, how, we, how micro and nanotechnologies can transform your business. Thank you.